Hello, my name is Fred Kusumoto. I'm the president of Heart Rhythm Society for this year, your representative voice. And one of the great things that I get to do is to meet with people, although virtually now, to talk about their experience with Heart Rhythm Society. So tonight uh, I have Sandeep uh, uh, Gautam with me. And uh, Sandeep, uh, would you introduce yourself? And uh, we'll start from there. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So first of all, thank you, Fred, uh, for uh, talking to me, inviting me to this. Uh, my name is Sandeep Gautam. I'm the Director of Cardiac Electrophysiology at the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri, and I've been an HRS member since 2009 and have uh, tried to attend almost every meeting that I possibly can. I really enjoy it. Well, that's really wonderful. And on a personal note, uh, you and I worked together on the Evidence Review Committee for the Ventricular Arrhythmias and Sudden Cardiac Death uh, document, and I thank you for your contribution to that. Thank you. Yeah, that was a, that was a great experience. Absolutely. So were you able to make it to Boston? Yeah, I was in Boston this year. I was actually there for the whole deal. I was in town with family this time because I had to show my daughter around uh, the college. Uh, she, she just started this year in Boston. Oh, I love that. I mean, that's really a, a wonderful thing. And I'm glad you were able to have your uh, daughter see some of the colleges there, the phenomenal universities there. Now I'm an old guy, so all mine are uh, long <laughs> since gone, but nonetheless, so exciting to um, incorporate family activities along with, um, you know, obviously a lot of learning. And speaking of that, uh, was there a specific session or that really sort of uh, got your interest or you thought was incredibly valuable uh, at uh, this year's uh, meeting? Yeah, so I actually, of course, I attended all the usual sessions and uh, attended the late-breaking clinical uh, trial sessions, et cetera. But I, I always like uh, attending the relatively smaller sessions where I think uh, there is more room for a, 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 for a better interaction of ideas between the audience and the speakers. Um, I really liked a session on uh, pulse feed ablation on the effect of this modality on cardiac structures independent of pulmonary veins. Uh, there was some very nice information that uh, the speakers shared with us during that session. Yeah, so what do you think about pulse field ablation? I mean, is this something that uh, you're excited about? Do you think it's gonna supplant uh, you know, our, our current technologies that we have? The technology is amazing. And uh, speaking to some people who have been sort of pioneers in the field, um, it, uh, 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 what I'm told by them is that it's a matter of time. Um, that all the debate that we have nowadays about uh, the different techniques of radiofrequency ablation, including uh, HPSD, the type of HPSD, 50 watts and 90 watts is all going to become moot in the next two to three years. Uh, I have not used the technology personally, so I cannot really claim my personal experience with that. Uh, but this is what it seems to be coming from all the studies and again, all from the personal stories that I've heard from others. Excellent. And Sandeep, do you have any concerns about uh, these new technologies? I mean, we always worry when new technologies come about. Uh, is there anything that uh, has you sort of yeah. worried before you think PFA would be ready for sort of, quote, prime time? Although I guess there's no prime time these days with streaming. But well, what has you worried about pulse field? Well, it's just like any new technology. Uh, so one of the things with radio frequency ablation is it. It, it probably took us one full year of our two-year cardiac EP fellowship to understand the physiology, uh, the physics behind radio frequency. So uh, what I'm concerned about is people rushing into PFA without really understanding what the technology is and what sort of effects you can expect from it, how it works, um, any, 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 uh, any offshoots, any undesirable offshoots of the technology. Uh, my, my concern is with PFA, people are excited about uh, how they're able, how they will be able to do rapid AF ablations and just turn the patients over and so on and so. On. But uh, I don't want them to lose sight of uh, other things which could happen with this technology. So, for example, in this session, um, they presented some very good data on the effect of uh, pulse feed ablation on AV nodal ablation, or I'm sorry, AV nodal conduction. Uh, so, from what we understand, uh, PFA appears to have a selectivity for uh, atrial myocardium simply because the atrial myocardial cells appear to be more amenable to electroporation, especially irreversible electroporation at lower voltage as compared to uh, distant structures such as esophagus. But the question is, does conduction tissue inside the heart have the same sort of resistance to uh, pulse field ablation? 
uh, Jacob Kurth from uh, Mount Sinai. And Jacob is one of the guys who just, you know, work, has worked with PFA right from the beginning in the initial swine models and so on. Presented some very nice data on the use of electroporation, pulse field ablation in a swine model of AV nodal uh, ablation. And they essentially used low power and high power electroporation in 20 pigs. And they wanted to, if, uh, uh, to study the effect on AV nodal conduction. What they found was with low power PFA, they were able to achieve AV nodal conduction delay in 13 out of 20 pigs, all of which appeared to be uh, uh, confined to the AV node. They did not see any infrahesion uh, delay. And all of them resolved within the next 10 to 40 seconds. One pig developed complete heart block, which also resolved completely. Now, what they also wanted to see was, would this finding be uh, uh, confined only to low dose uh, or low voltage uh, PFA? So they then tested high uh, dose PFA in, uh, again in a pig model, and they used uh, 14 pigs, and they were able to induce actually complete AV block in 12 out of 14, all of them recovered. The longest delay to recovery was 127 seconds. What interests me in this is the potential to use pulse field ablation in atrial tachycardias, parahesian accessory pathways, sort of like what we do with cryoablation now, but hopefully with more durable effects. And hopefully at some point we can figure out what dose of uh, electroporation of PFA we need for, uh, uh, for Kent fibers or uh, for accessory pathways. Uh, so that is something which I found interesting. And I, 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 I really applaud the investigators for working on this and trying to find uh, um, any, any possible complications with uh, pulse rate ablation. Um, the same session also had a very nice talk uh, uh, by uh, a group of investigators on the effect of pulse field ablation on phrenic nerve. So that is another thing, you know, we do PFA, we know it does not possibly, or so far it has not affected the esophagus, but what about the phrenic nerve? So again, they used a swine model and they specifically targeted the phrenic nerve region with PFA uh, while performing SVC and right superior pulmonary vein isolation. So sort of trying to duplicate a clinical scenario and specifically looking for sites where the phrenic nerve could be, uh, uh, could be stimulated and using the lowest possible threshold, pacing threshold at which the phrenic nerve could be stimulated and then performing both low dose and high dose PFA. And all the pigs were sacrificed at some point over the next month. There was no phrenic nerve damage. There was no change in diaphragmatic contraction on the microscopic analysis, there was no evidence of any micro or macroscopic phrenic nerve damage. While at one month, the SVC and the RFPV were both confirmed to be isolated. That's very exciting finding for me. You know, that means that if I ever start using this technology, I can potentially use the lattice catheter, the lattice PFA catheter uh, in the SVC without fear. Of course, this finding will have to be duplicated in uh, human uh, models and so on. Um, there was one other talk in the same session by Dr. Natali's group. And uh, again, that is something which uh, is uh, novel, which basically looks at any extra cardiac effects of PFA. In this session, they performed real time transcranial Doppler using a novel artificial intelligence technology in six patients undergoing PVI uh, with pulse field ablation. And they looked at uh, uh, microembolic signals uh, suggesting a sudden rush of macroemboli from the heart to the brain during PFA. They used four pulses of PFA for each vein, and they found that at the third and fourth pulse, they often saw a rush of microemboli. Whether this has any clinical significance or not is not yet known. But again, it's a cautionary tale. Now, it, may, it is possible, and one, one may advocate the use of routine uh, 24 hour cardiac, uh, 24 hour uh, uh, cranial MRI in uh, a PFA case cohort and see if there are any more lesions than what would expect with RFA. So that's why I like this session, really. Yeah, no, it goes to a couple things, right, Sandeep? It's, it's these smaller sessions that make you know, heart rhythm so valuable. You know, obviously everyone loves the late breaking clinical trials and the plenaries and this sort of thing, but 
you know, it's at these sorts of sessions where real interaction, you know, can occur and a real sharing of ideas and thoughts. I mean, just chatting with you has already had me thinking, boy, wouldn't it be great to be able to do um, that slow pathway modification and really not have to worry about uh, causing a complete heart block. But that's certainly, as you point out, something that we'll just have to wait for larger clinical studies uh, to happen. That's true. So, with that, the last thing I want to do, uh, Cindy, is to thank you for being a pace setter this year. As you know, uh, as a pace setter, you're chosen because of your activity in the uh, sort of the social media sphere. And I really think that that is such an important piece because that allows then delivery of information of our message throughout uh, the entire blogosphere, right? Uh, whether it be to other uh, colleagues in EP, whether it be to people outside of electrophysiology, to our patients. And I just want to thank you for um, doing this sort of work and getting the message out and really um, encouraging collaboration in this way. No, and I thank you. Uh, I thank you and HRS for giving me the chance to do that. And I would like to take this opportunity to uh, echo your concern about the upcoming Medicare cuts uh, in uh, ablation procedures. And I, would, uh, I will do my best to spread the message um, to enable electrophysiologists to fight that uh, unfair uh, decision. Thank you so much. It is unfair. And you know, the important point is this is at a, at a time where that cusp after East AFNet 4, where we really have seen the value of this early and aggressive rhythm control of management of identifying patients with atrial fibrillation for overall health care. Thank you, Sandeep. Thank you, Fred.